In this video, we will review over the anatomy of the crawfish. Now, the crawfish is in the kingdom Animalia, phylum Arthropoda. The arthropods are the largest of all of the animal phylums. Three quarters of all known animal species are arthropods. Now, this group is going to be characterized by a chitinous exoskeleton, segmentation, and jointed appendages, which may be highly modified for various functions. Growth of the crayfish will occur by molting, and um, when we look at the crayfish, we'll further uh, differentiate it and place it in the subphylum crustacean. Now, this means that the crayfish have two pairs of antenna, and um, it's the only arthropod group that is primarily aquatic. The, cray the crayfish live in freshwater ponds, streams, and lakes. They're primarily scavengers feeding on dead and decaying material, but they may also be predatory on small invertebrates, which they can catch. Now we're going to begin the external anatomy of, of the crawfish on the dorsal side. The body shows two well-defined regions, the anterior cephalothorax and then the uh, posterior abdomen region. The cephalothorax is going to be consisting of a fused head and thorax, and the abdomen is going to consist of six distinct segments that we can count down. This cephalothorax is made up of five head segments and eight thoracic segments, and they're fused and covered by a tough carapace. Now, the lateral extensions of the carapace cover the gills, and uh, the point of fusion is evident by a line right along in there known as that cervical groove. The head terminates anteriorly in a pointed projection called the rostrum. And just beneath the rostrum, we're going to see these compound eyes. Now, the first thing we're going to do is to locate the paired appendages, the antennas. So we've got those two pairs right along there. The first pair is going to be right in front of the eyes, and then the second pair is going to be shorter and it's going to have two branches. Now, because the appendages here have two branches, this is known as biramus. When we look at the grasshopper later on, it only has one pair of appendages and there, therefore it will be called uniramus. So here we have those antennas and we can see the branching which allows it to be called biramus. Now these outer branchings right here are called the exopodites and these inner ones right here are called the endopodites. So here we have a dorsal view of the crayfish and I just put this slide in with all the parts labeled so that you could hit pause if you needed to and just grasp where all of these anatomical structures were located on the crayfish. Now here we have the ventral side of the crayfish and hex head segments 3, 4, and 5 bear the pairs of mouth parts, which are modified appendages. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on. Now, that when we look at the thorax region, we have eight segments, each bearing a pair of appendages. The first three pairs uh, are going to be turned anterior and are used for feeding. See those right in there. The larger pinchers here are known as the chelipeds, and they're used for feeding and for defense. And then we get into the walking legs, also known as the parapods. Moving back to the um, abdomen region, you will see these structures right here that are often called swimmerettes. Uh, they are called the pleopods. Swimmerette is not a good choice of term, however, since they're not used for swimming. These pleopods function to aid in water circulation over the gills and also serve for reproductive purposes. Now the anterior two pleopods in the male are going to be enlarged and then they're modified for transferring sperm. And the first two pairs of abdominal appendages in the female are going to are reduced in size. In the female, all five pairs of pleopods are used to hold the eggs until they hatch. And so you could distinguish the male from the female by looking at the sizes of the pleopods. Now the last part of the abdomen that we see is going to have this 
uh, tail region and you'll have those paddle like uropods and then right in the center we have the telson now it is in the center of the telson that we will have the opening for the anus now the telson and the uropods collectively make up the tail fan and this aids in the uh, ability for the uh, crayfish to swim backwards and just to clarify before we move on there are a pair of uropods on this side there are a pair of uropods on this side with the telson in the center so we'll have two uh, uropods here two here and then the telson crayfish exhibit sexual dimorphism and are dioecious so depending on the gender of the crayfish you dissect you will have uh, seen either testes or ovaries behind the heart region. The easiest way to determine the male versus female is going to be looking at the external structures. Now the male delivers the sperm through the copulatory swimmerettes into the female's uh, seminal receptacles where she stores it. The copulation will typically occur shortly after molting in the fall but the fertilization of the eggs takes place in the spring and so the female will lay her eggs into the swimmerettes of her abdomen and she will carry and protect and aerate these eggs until until they hatch into little larvae and then when they're mature enough to venture into their own world then uh, the female will uh, leave the, uh, the, the organism. Now when she is uh, brooding her eggs she is said to be in berry because she looks like she's carrying a bunch of berries beneath her abdomen. So the best way to identify, to identify male versus female is to, to look at these swimmerettes that are located here and so you're going to see these enlarged swimmerette pairs on the male and then you're going to see the first two pairs of swimmerettes being extremely reduced on the female and this will be the easiest way to identify male versus female on your uh, crayfish. Here we have the crayfish mouth appendages and we can see the first maxillopad, the second maxillopad, and we can see the mandible. Now the head segments three, four, and five bear those paired mouth parts which are modified appendages. We could locate the pair of hard white jaws uh, or mandibles on either side of the mouth uh, but these structures might be a little difficult to see until the other mouth parts are removed. The first and second maxillopad are on the fourth and fifth head segments. The second maxilla is a leaf-like and it's the most ventral surface. We can see that right here. Um, dorsal to the second maxillopad and next to the mandible we're going to see the first maxillopad and it is also leaf-like. The maxillae are directly involved with the uh, manipulation of food and so what we need to do in order to see some of these structures it's just to remove some of these maxillopads and then that would allow this um, hard colored uh, mandible to be visible. Here we have just a side view and again we can see the antennules and the antenna and we can see those defense chelipeds and we can see the eye and the cervical groove, the cephalothorax, we can see the uh, six regions of the, uh, the abdomen, we can see the uh, parapods and the pleopods, the outer uh, uropods and in between we would have the telson. Now let's look at removing this hard carapace and let's see the internal structures that would, would be visible below. Now here we have removed the carapace and we are showing the internal structures of the um, crayfish and you'll notice that we have the rostrum right here. Now right behind the rostrum you will see the cardiac and the pyloric stomachs. The cardiac stomach is the site of initial mechanical breakdown of the food and enzymatic activity. The pyloric stomach is where further digestion takes place. So by the time the food has reached the pyloric stomach, it is uh, in a liquid consistency. Now on either side of the stomachs is the prominent digestive glands. And these are also called hepatopancreas or the liver. And they serve as a function uh, in food storage and in the production of digestive juices and enzymes so that food would enter the uh, mouth and then it would move into the esophagus and then into the cardiac stomach followed by the pyloric stomach and uh, the digestive glands would aid in the, uh, the digestion and then from the pyloric stomach 
this liquefied material would then move into the intestines and the intestines are located right here and they run the length of the body all the way back to the telson where the waste is passed through the anus. Also, notice the gills that are located right here. Now, like most aquatic animals, crayfish breathe through gills, and the gills are going to be well vascularized, and they're going to have a textured appearance. We can see that right in this area here uh, by structures called gill filaments. And this is to increase the surface area for absorption of the oxygen so that the oxygenated water is pushed into the body cavity by the gill balers, and then that's going to be located on the second pair of the maxillae. And so that uh, this area right here would have maximum area for absorption and pulling that oxygen from the water. Another structure that's visible is this green gland right here. Now this green gland is not uh, green, it doesn't appear green, um, but this right here is an antennal gland and it's round and it's got a very distinct structure. Um, this right here functions to regulate ions to remove urine and reabsorb salt and water. And so also called the antennal gland or the green gland, it leads to the bladder. And you probably will not be able to see the bladder to see where it leads to, but identifying the green gland would be an important structure to, uh, to see. And here we have just another view where we can see the green gland, we can see the gills, we can see the digestive gland on either side. But it's this right here that I want to spend just a moment on. This is that anterior gastric muscle. And so when you first remove the carapace, what you're going to see is you're going to see this anterior gastric muscle. And this covers the cardiac stomach. And so you would need to remove this in order to see the cardiac stomach. And that had been removed on that previous slide to allow you to see it. The posterior gastric muscle would be located right behind the pyloric stomach. And so just clearing off some of those areas would allow the stomachs to be more visible. Now here we can see the heart. Like all arthropods, the crayfish have an open circulatory system which consists of a single chambered heart that contains an ostea and several arteries but no veins and that makes this an open circulatory system. The circulating fluid is called hemolymph and it is pumped through the hemocyl, the hemocyl being this open body cavity of the arthropod. Now, with regard to the crayfish's nervous system, it consists of a brain, which is actually a pair of um, supraesophageal uh, ganglia. Now, most of the structures associated with the nervous system of the crayfish would be difficult for you to find during your crayfish dissection. There are other sensory apparatus that are easily identified, and that would include the antenna and the antennules, the compound eyes, and if you look closely at the appendages, you might see some sensory hairs. Uh, the uh, structures such as chemoreceptors are typically located on the various mouth appendages and the antennas and the antennules, and it helps the crayfish to taste and to smell in the aquatic environment. And then at the tip of the uh, antennules are statuses, which function in balance. So while the nervous system is not clearly defined, such as in a human, you can see the various components of the nervous system on the crayfish.